Welcome back. In this video, we look at Python lists, which are one of the most useful data structures in Python. A Python list is an ordered sequence of objects. The elements in a list can be any type of object, including other lists. Lists are indexed with square brackets, like strings, but unlike strings, they are mutable. You can modify a list in place. Here's a gotcha to be aware of. Python would let you overwrite the built-in list function, so don't do that. If you accidentally do that, exit Python, go back in, and list will be restored. We can create a list in a couple of ways. One is we can create a literal list here in square brackets. And another way is that we can use that built-in list function. Here, also using the range function to create a list. Let's see what those lists look like. Now let's concatenate those two lists together and print out the length. If we want to add just one element, we need to surround it with the square braces. If we leave off the square brackets around the item we want to add, and try to concatenate that to a list, it will throw an exception. It says we can't concatenate a list to an integer. We've seen the for in style of loop before, and this will work with any iterable object. So we see here it works with a list. It iterates over each element in the list, and it also works with strings. Lists are just one example of Python's general purpose built-in container data structures. There are a lot of built-in methods that work on container structures. Let's look at a few. The index method applied to a list will return the index of the element in the list if it is there. But notice that it throws an exception if it's not there. That's why we check first if it is there. Next, we look at the sort, sorted, and reverse methods. Sort will sort the list in place, returning none. Sorted returns a new sorted list and leaves the original list unchanged. Reverse will reverse the list in place, returning none. Let's look at sorted first. Sorted returns a sorted list that will be iterated over in this for loop. But as we see with the print, the original list is unchanged. We see the actual list is not been sorted. In contrast, the sort method actually changes the list to sort in place. And reverse does the reverse sort in place. Because lists are mutable, we have many methods that let us modify the list in place. We'll look at a few of those insert, append, remove, and pop. First we start off with a small list here, and then we insert at position zero a new item. Append will add it to the end of the list, and we see pair here at the end of the list. Remove will remove an item if it exists in the list, but it will throw an error if it's not in the list, so we check that it's there first and we see that apple's gone. Pop, by default, pops off the last element, and we see that pair is missing. With pop, we can specify the index we want to pop off, so here we're popping off the first element, which will be peach, and we see that peach is gone. We need to be aware of efficiency in list processing. It turns out that when we add or remove an element from the front of the list, that's an ON operation, whereas adding or removing from the end of the list is an O1 operation. Let's look at this example. I created a list of about 100k elements, started a timer, and then timed how long it took to pop off every element from the head of the list, and that took about 0.9 seconds. In contrast, with the same list, popping off the end took 0.007 seconds. 
In the notebook in the GitHub, I have a link to a list time complexity page for the cost of list operations. If we really do need to pop the list elements off the beginning of the list, a better alternative is to reverse the list first and then pop off the end of the list. This took 0 0.008 seconds compared to 0.9 seconds here. We can slice a list with the same start-stop notation we use for strings. If we omit both start and stop, it makes a copy of the string. You can delete everything in the list with this notation. And we see now that list 1 has three elements still, and list 0 now is an empty list. Your first tendency when iterating over a list will be to write a for loop as you do in other languages. However, Python provides a more efficient approach in list comprehensions. A list comprehension will return a new list based on what you did with an existing iterable object. A list comprehension is surrounded by the square brackets, meaning it will return a list. The first item is what is going to be appended to the list, and the second part shows the iteration. Let's look at a simple example comparing a for loop to a list comprehension. In the for loop, we start with an empty list, iterate from 0 to 4, appending i each time. That can be replaced with one line list comprehension. The thing we're appending, i, goes first, and then our loop part. Notice the correspondence between what we're appending and the loop part. And we'll print out the list here to show that we got the same results. This syntax takes a little getting used to, so let's look at another example. In this example, we're taking the numbers 1 through 5 and adding their squares to a list. In the loop version, we start off with an empty list, go through our iterations, appending the square each time. The list comprehension, we have the thing we're appending at the first, so i squared, for each i in the range. And we see we got the same results. So what are the benefits of list comprehension? Many people find them more expressive and easier to read once you get used to them. Notice that we've replaced three lines of code here with one line of code. List comprehensions can also be more time efficient than loops. In this example, notice that what we're appending is itself a list. So this list comprehension will create a list of lists. As this iterated through 1, 2, and 3, it created a list where the first element was 1, 2, or 3, and the second element was its square. What about nested loops? We can create a nested loop comprehension. Here we're creating a list of lists again with x, y, where x is going to iterate over 1 and 2, and y is going to iterate over a, b, and c. We can also add an if condition. So in other words, we're not going to append every x, x squared pair. We're only going to select those where the square is less than 100. And this time we're ranging from 1 to 12. Let's look at a text processing example. We start off with a string, which we're going to split into a list of strings, as we see here. Then we're going to iterate over that list, selecting only those tokens that start with S. And we see we were able to extract out of this token list only those that started with S. In these videos, I like to share with you things that I learned the hard way. Here's an example. Strange things can happen when you copy a list that contains lists. So I have list 1, which itself contains a list, and I copy it to list 2. Now in list 2, I change one of the elements in the inner list. Notice when I printed out list 1, which is not the list I changed, 
that the inner list was changed as well. How can we explain this odd behavior? The answer is the way Python manages memory. The list within the list is actually a pointer to a list. So when list1 is copied to list2, the pointer is copied. How can we get around this? The way is to use a deep copy. This copy right here is referred to as a shallow copy. The deep copy will fix our problem. Notice now when we change list2's inner list, list1 remained unchanged. I have a practice for you. I want you to write a Python program in the IDE of your choice. The program will operate on two lists. I have code down here showing how you can make two lists from random numbers using list comprehensions. So you're going to write three functions, all have the same purpose. To return a list of the same length as list 1, with 0 if that element does not appear in list 2, and 1 if it does. For function 1, I'd like you to write a loop within a loop. For function 2, write a one loop function using the in operator. And function 3, use a list comprehension. I would start with two small lists until you get the logic right, then test it with larger lists of random numbers. And compare the timings of all three functions. Let me give a little extra explanation of what these functions do. You're going to have two lists, and they don't have to be of the same length. Let's say list 1 has 4, 8, and 12. List 2 has 9, 5, and 4. Your resulting list is going to be the same length as list 1. And each location is going to have a 1 or 0, representing the binary reality of if that corresponding element existed in list 2 or not. So for example, 4 is in list 2, so there's a 1. 8 and 12 are not in list 2, so there's zeros there. We'll talk about this in the next video. Until then, happy coding! Mm -hmm.